This is the Biblical Mind Podcast, produced by the Center for Hebraic Thought. Honest five-star reviews help others to find this podcast. Visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org for articles and videos that explore the deep structures of Scripture. Different people use the word gender differently, and there's actually battles going on now about um, whether there's only two genders or whether there's this infinite number of genders. And the history of the word really comes from uh, how we biologically produce, generate. <laughs> so uh, women generate different than men generate. Um, and I've, I've come to agree with a lot of people who just don't see the word as very helpful at all anymore because so many want to just refer to the word gender as um, kind of the cultural constructions of our time, like what makes a woman and what makes a man. And, and it might be long hair and, and a dress and makeup and uh, being a stay at home mom or being a career woman. Um, there's all these different ways that we want to fight over what gender can have. But I think, um, especially as a Christian, how troubling that thinking is and how reductive it is, because as a woman, um, everything that I do is feminine. Uh, femininity is a unique and specific characteristic that I have as a woman. It's not an attribute that I put on um, to try to become a woman. So mm. I prefer to um, just use the term sex when I'm speaking about all of, of these issues, because I find it a lot more helpful. And I've, and I've uh, been looking at a lot of Pope John Paul II's work on this, which I think is really helpful. And he talks about the glory of the human body before God and the glory of God in the human body, in our sexes as men and women. And I just think this is something much more theological and, and beautiful that, that our bodies actually speak and tell God's story of his spousal love for his bride, which is, you know, it just kind of blows all these silly discussions about gender out of the water. Yeah, I think the um, there's lots of people going back to JP 2s work on the body uh, in the last yeah. decade or so. It's a it's a rich resource, and he speaks both you know from a deep theological convictions uh, mm -hmm. and understanding of scripture, but also kind of the phenomenology of what it's like to be a, a man or a woman in the world as well. So when you say what you are as feminine, uh, mm -hmm. let's let's push that a little bit further. What would that include for you? Like a you know your daily life. What is feminine that would be demarcated from masculine, as uh, as it were, um, that Amy Bird does that mm -hmm. <laughs> you know her husband wouldn't do? Well, I mean, and, and that's something interesting to talk about too, which um, some Catholic um, philosophers like Julian, um, what is his last name? I can't think of his last name all of a sudden, but oh, I can't remember Julian? it. Julian. Julian something. <laughs> oh, <laughs> think I, of his last name, but he talks talk. about sexual installation. So, you know, I'm in like, I'm installed as a woman sexually. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is going to characterize a lot of what I do just because of the, the body that I'm in and the cells that make it up. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of research about men and women. But I think that even in the story of creation, it reveals something about um, how we look to one another and realize our own selves as men and as women. Um, not only can I look to other women to find out what it means to be a woman, but I also look to my brothers to understand my own sexuality as, as different from theirs in, in, in complex ways, um, not reductive ways. And, you know, I even see that in um, a lot of the debate about gender with the, the transgender community. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I really feel for the, uh, the gender dysphoric, but and just dysphoria. However, when I look at their idea of, let's say, a man to become a woman, and he's putting on these stereotypes, and no matter how much you want to pretend, you can't truly be feminine. And so when I look at these stereotypes that they're putting on, I'm not I even identifying with that as a woman, like I don't necessarily mm. want to look like a pinup girl <laughs> on the cover of a magazine. Um, and to me mm. that takes away from my dignity 
and my personhood as a woman. And so I think that's where JP2's work has been very helpful is in restoring the dignity um, and personhood of the woman. Um, and Christ is, you know, the one who has restored that foremost. And he talks about how the symbol of the bridegroom is masculine. And as a man, he revealed the dignity belonging to women. And I think that there's this model of love and we see this in creation. And then we see this again in Christ. Um, it's an order of love. And so the order of creation really does tell us a story. Like man was created first and he was created from the dirt. But then he's got all these animals parading before him. And, and there's no one before him that shows that he can have any kind of communion uh, in personhood, any kind of relationship like that until the woman's created. And, and with that, he has to be put down to sleep for her. And, and she's created from part of his very body that he sacrifices for her not from the dirt. She's not created from the dirt. And I think that there's something there that is really showing um, man's telos. So when he has woman created from his side, he's beholding what he is to become really a symbol of that, which is the collective bride of Christ. And so there's this order of love to where the bridegroom is the lover and the bride is the beloved. And yet it's reciprocal. She wears this love and she fructifies it and returns this love back to him. And we can see this um, in erotic love and spousal love and marriage, but um, also even in platonic brother-sister love. So I do think that it's, it's not something that you can say, well, here's a list of what it means to be a woman. Obviously, there's clear things as far as the way that we're built, the way that we generate, um, and things like that. I'm going to be, I think, in our relationships we really show uh, these kind of uh, differences between women and men. Um, I can never be a brother or an uncle or a son. I'm a, I'm a sister and an aunt and a mother and a daughter. Like those relational terms really um, categorize me as a woman. So if I hear you correctly, you basically want to double down on the human body uh, mm -hmm. as we find it and let it determine something about our relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess where that seems like a project that can go overboard uh, when yeah. your cultural assumptions about the human body are not checked in any way. So I, I wonder what are the common, you, you speak a lot on this issue. Mm -hmm. You've written quite a bit on it. Uh, what are the most common cultural assumptions you find in the Protestant American church oh, about, yeah. uh, about the body? Well, I think the biggest one, and it goes back to this creation order too, and you know, all the way back to you know, Greco-Roman assumptions, pagan assumptions, um, that our very ontology is different in the sense that men are, they in their essence are authoritative over women who are in their very essence are subordinate. And so that has then that type of thinking, which, you know, some people who might in the church who may say, oh, no, you know, I don't, I don't think that. But then when you get down to it, you find there's a lot of sympathy with this, you know, it's an underlying theology that a lot of people have um, in the church. And so therefore, um, you, you get some crazy uh, directives towards women that, um, to the sense that a woman gives any kind of personal or direct guidance to a man, she is offending his very manliness and manhood. Hmm. Okay. Can we stop at that right there? And just because uh, I have not heard about this until I heard you talk about it. It must be just the circles we run in. But mm -hmm. um, this idea of giving direction and guidance to a man, as somebody who teaches Hebrew Bible every semester, mm -hmm. like I can't stop but run through all the examples. Um, I mean, I, I know everybody runs to Deborah. Mm -hmm. I think they often mistakenly run to Deborah um, mm -hmm. because I think of Deborah as the judge, the one who's adjudicating the Torah under the tree as probably the most powerful indicator mm -hmm. of her position in life um, as the prophetess who's recontextualizing the Torah to present circumstances uh, for presumably the men and the women um, in her region. Um, but then I, you know, I think of uh, Abigail, I think of mm -hmm. the, the women who don't even have a name. They're just known as the wise woman of Avil, the wise mm -hmm. woman of Tekoa. 
um, these women who step in uh, and s- seem to know what's going on where the men don't, uh, mm-hmm. and they usually are calming down some rash problem created by the men around them. Um, and they're valor, they're, they're clearly valorized in the mm-hmm. text. You see the same thing in the Gospels as well, um, where women come in and understand what's going on, and the disciples are just bumbling dolts all the way through. <laughs> so I really do wonder, just from a biblical perspective, what's fueling, like, I, I can't even situate that view within scripture itself well a lot of times they go to first timothy 2 about a woman not teaching or exercising authority over a man um and that's such a a huge text for them and they kind of apply that um and and it's funny because like what you're sharing about you know reading all of scripture within the whole canon (laughs) is a huge which is what i was trying to do as a presbyterian minister (laughs) It's a huge part of biblical interpretation, right? Is to be able to interpret scripture according to the rest of scripture um, and look at the whole canon. So um, there's certain things that we can know that that verse doesn't mean. And, you know, you can break down the Greek of the word, you know, the translation for the word authority there and and different things like that. But um, they they take that text and then they also take the text in 1 Corinthians 11 about Christ being the head of the man and the man being the head of the woman. And they just blanketly apply it then to mean that all men have authority over over women and um obviously teaching can can hold formal roles and and informal roles we have special office and general office in church and um you see women functioning in scripture definitely teaching all over the place like you're saying there's even plenty of verses in scripture telling us as lay people that we should be teachers. So you know, what do we do with all of those verses, such as, you know, Colossians 3.16 or Hebrews 5.12 or Romans 12.6-8 or 1 Corinthians 12.31, 1 Corinthians 14.1 and, and 14.26. None of those are gendered verses. Um, but you see they're teaching even breaking down not only in the church, not only even in the home, which, you know, I have – definite pushback with both of those things too. But they take this into common life even because this is an ontological thing. So um, the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood even goes as far as to um, give suggestions in their, in their big book on recovering biblical manhood and womanhood. Um, if a man were to get lost uh, driving in a neighborhood, like this kind of scenario, and the only person he can see available to ask directions from is like a housewife. <laughs> this is like the, the illustration itself is very stereotypical is a housewife outside. Um, how could he I'm, ask her for I'm directions? I'm not laughing along because I'm a little bit horrified. Go ahead. I'm yeah. Sorry. How, can, how can he ask her for directions and receive those directions without taking it as personal and direct guidance and therefore offending his masculinity? Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. But this really seems to posit, and, and, and I do wonder how much of this is reactive to the sexual revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. And, and in many ways, I think probably uh, you and I would ag- agree that there are lots of reactions we should have to the sexual revolution. Absolutely, yeah. But it really seems to problematize the woman in this Mm -hmm. uh, scenario so that she's fundamentally um, I don't know what the word would be. Uh, She's the one who can bring down the man, I guess Mm -hmm. almost like every woman is a potential Jezebel here. Yes. And and I wonder why, you know, just to put it on the table, why is that a problematic view? Why I have three daughters. I would, (laughs) you know, I teach them every day. Hey, don't be a Jezebel when they wake up. Okay. Well, it's a problematic view and that that's what's assumed about woman. Um, and it takes away her very dignity and her personhood. And so, um, you know, you look in creation and you see that uh, when you break down this Ezer Konegdo for, you know, mm-hmm. what woman is called as a helper, um, you know, she's to be a cor- corresponding strength, a necessary ally to man. But how could she be an ally if she's looked at and perceived as a threat, if she needs to be managed all the time? Um, how how is she an ally? Or in the very definitions that are given for m- mature masculinity and mature femininity from the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, um, the definitions are 
at the heart of mature masculinity is a sense of benevolent responsibility to lead, provide for, and protect women in ways appropriate to a man's differing relationships. At the heart of mature femininity is a freeing disposition to affirm, receive, and nurture strength and leadership from worthy men in ways appropriate to a woman's different relationships. So my very femininity is supposed to be defined by how I look for and nurture male leadership and my neighbors and my coworkers and my even male man carriers. Um, so you see this masculinity is active and potent and, and femininity is just kind of an, an affirmation of masculinity. It's parasitic. And so there is no personhood there. She has no contribution of her own. That's not only as a woman, but just as a unique and unrepeatable person. So the Center for Biblical, or sorry, the Center for Hebraic Thought, and we have this new <laughs> mag- magazine, I'm mixing up the biblical mind. Mm-hmm. We're trying to think about how scripture thinks about modern issues and ancient alike. And so I wonder, because um, I, I, again, I'm racking my brain thinking, um, you know, if, if this were the case that men are to be the ones who are dominant and the women who are the ones to be supporting these dominant guys, we should see regular teaching of that, and and I and by teaching I include narratives that show where this is this is good and rewarded, or mm-hmm. um, cautionary tales as well. I can think of lots of cautionary tales where men mislead and abuse uh, women mm-hmm. um, or lead to their abuse. I where do you go in scripture? To, okay, so let's let's just put creation on the table as a given, mm-hmm. uh, as some kind of equality of humanity. Uh, and say functionally it's ambiguous, uh, you know, we'll just start the argument somewhere after that. Where do you go in scripture to construct for people a biblical theology uh, of gender roles? It's interesting because even stepping back, I'm really careful about how I use a phrase like gender roles because yeah. the, the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood has kind of taken ownership on how we use this language and we don't even realize it, but they're using the word role as if that is an ontological um, attribute that we have. And it isn't the word role comes from the theater. It's something that you, you know, play (laughs) or rehearse. Um, It's not something that is permanent, permanently fixed. So um, they use these words when they use the word gender roles and they're, they're referring right back to their ontology of male authority and female submission. So um, instead of very medieval move, yes. Like instead (laughs) of using like, like reacting to our terminology now and trying to then go back in God's word and see what he says about it. um, I prefer to kind of uh, zoom out a little bit more and see how God uses not only men and women as, as different uh, people in history and scripture, but um, also just how he's using the masculine and the feminine voice in scripture. And mm-hmm. I find that really fascinating because, um, you know, the radical biblical feminists say that scripture is this patriarchal document that's put together um, to suppress women, you know, we have the, all the male power. And, um, as a conservative church, you know, we would balk at that and say, you know, this isn't true. However, the way that we uh, market our resources in the Christian bookstore, and then ha- the way that we set up men's w- uh, ministries and women's ministries in church, I think that we're sending the very exact same message that the Bible is so male centered and mm-hmm. authored that women need our own resources to be able to relate to it. But when you look in scripture, you see something much different. You know, you see, uh, God's word written in this patriarchal context. However, um, amazingly so, you see the woman's voice throughout scripture, even though it's an androcentric text, you have these interruptions uh, of the female voice. And, and it functions in a really fascinating way. Richard Baucom wrote this book called uh, Gospel Women. And he, he introduces this term that everybody wants to laugh at, but I think it's wonderful. Um, it's, and I get actually a lot of criticism for it too, but he calls it gynocentric interruptions. That sounds like Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Told something he would say with a straight face. Right. So you have this androcentric text, and then all of a sudden, like the woman's voice kind of interrupts a little bit, uh, and it um, on purposely so, so that it's kind of showing us here is the story behind the story. 
Um, um, it's going to make visible what's invisible with only the male voice, which is inadequate by itself. And so um, it's all throughout scripture, but he uses the book of Ruth as kind of a model mm. to show how that functions. And in Ruth, you know, we have not only a female perspective um, in this narrative, um, but it's also the perspective of a Moabite and, and a widow. And so you get this whole rich text about God's hess of love. And then at the end, all of a sudden there's this patrilineal genealogy. And it's almost as if it's cut and paste on there. There's a complete um, different change in the tone. Um, and he shows that that's kind of showing us that uh, there, this patrilineal genealogy is telling us the same history as the narrative that we just read. However, you're seeing what you're missing out with just the male voice. And so there's so many different areas that we can enter into from the outsider's point of view, showing God's hesed love um, to his people and how he keeps his promises. So it's, I think, a very beautiful thing. And you see it all throughout scripture. And you wonder, even like, let's go into Genesis and think of like the midwives, uh, Shifra and Pua. Um, oh, Exodus. Or Exodus. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, um, no. Shifra and Pua. And we don't even have the name of the Pharaoh pharaoh recorded then but we have their names and we know what happened then because they actually passed down their story and it was eventually recorded so so often we see that women too are tradents of the faith they were also passing down their stories and then here we have it alive in scripture and the living word of god um, so their stories, their experiences are valuable to God and to his people, even in such a, a patriarchal time. Yeah. And we, and I, I'm working on a Bible study on Exodus right now. And, mm. uh, we're in the first few chapters and it struck me once again, how, you know, we, we get hung up on the burning bush, I, I guess, rightfully. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but if you look at who who the action verbs are surrounding, it's it's women all the way uh, who are rescuing, saving, yeah. and, and creating civil disobedience in the sake uh, for the sake of y- Yahweh's justice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, including Zipporah in that strange yes. circumcision scene. But nonetheless, she figured out, and it's not just women; it's often foreign women as well. So this right. idea that our instinct to other people and to separate the, the us versus them. Yeah, it's it's just a bad like for me, principally speaking, it seems so obvious in scripture. These are bad modes of thinking is to create us and them, uh, these mm-hmm. and those uh, distinctions. And it's so reductive. And, there's no re- reciprocity there, right? And there's also no uh, there's no uniqueness to each of us as people as well. Not only a, a feminine person, but I'm a person, <laughs> right? person first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wonder, yeah, that I, this just sprang to my mind. So we might have to cut it out later if, it, if this goes horribly wrong. But um, a friend posted a video of a woman getting beat up on the subway. We're in New York city. Mm. So this is, I I've had to actually physically step in before where guys were wow. mistreating. I mean, it's, it's a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how it happens publicly, but it does. Mm-hmm. And um, so this guy's beating up his girlfriend. She's, she's fighting back. She's, she's putting up a fight as well and everybody's standing around filming it. Right. And the sentiment that my friend said, which I agree with is, you know, where, why were these guys standing around filming it? And I just offered a a, a slight correction. I said, why was it, why were the women standing around filming it as Mm -hmm. well? Like there's, there's nothing though. And the, the, the sentiment was that men should have jumped in and taken care of this guy, which I agree with. They Mm -hmm. should have, but Mm -hmm. also the women, like what if it was a subway full of women Mm -hmm. and it's just this one guy doing this. I mean, there's really nothing that, a strong guy can't do that. Uh, you know, one point two women can't do as well when it, uh, <laughs> when it comes to physicality. But but there really was this kind of almost like um, well, women would just have to suffer and, and put up with this kind of behavior. And I I mean, me and my wife teach our daughters that if they're ever nervous in the subways, mm-hmm. go find someone who looks like a mom because she's much more likely to protect them yeah. than some twenty year old dude. Sorry, twenty year old dudes. <laughs> The moms are scarier. <laughs> but moms will go bear on you, right? Um, and so even this idea of like the the physical protection, I, I wonder if we lose something about being a, a, a biblically minded society if we say, well, that's actually for the guys and that's for the stronger. Because I have to point out, you know, in 
in the Torah, it's also if you're faint of heart, you don't have to go to war, if, even if you're a man, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so I wonder if, if not, sorry, I just threw that example on you, but I wonder how that strikes you, if you agree or you would correct me on. on yeah, I, I'm, first of all, my own background, I come from a martial arts family, like I grew oh, up, okay. up in that. So um, I, my dad has instilled in me um, self-defense. And I think he really got it in the sense of his teaching about self-defense is that it's about giving yourself for someone else. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not just about protecting yourself. Um, And so I think, you know, he's never divided that into a man woman thing growing Mm -hmm. up. However, he's been very honest, you know, with me (laughs) about the physical limits that women have and that men have. And so show, you know, and, and he would teach us then differently. Like, you know, jujitsu is really great for women. Um, half the time we don't even realize we're being attacked until we're, it's like over 90 mm. something percent of the time we're already on the ground. So mm. uh, t- to be able to use your legs, you know, to be able to know how to leverage things like that. Um, it's not, Oh, you're vulnerable and weak. So you therefore uh, be passive. Um, it's here's your situations. <laughs> and now of course, I do believe that men should be the first to sacrifice and lay down their own lives. I think that that story is shown in creation. I think that story is shown in Christ as a man. Um, I think that uh, part of that too, just in like natural theology is that women have a corresponding strength and our bodies are equipped to do something amazing in um, giving birth (laughs) and nurturing Mm -hmm. and feeding a child. But that also makes us vulnerable. So that I do believe like, you know, that's the way I look at it as I see where men then are equipped with a different kind of strength to help a step into that vulnerability then and use their own bodies to protect. But in like a scenario, like you're saying, absolutely. I think we should always be thinking about self-sacrifice and helping others. And isn't that such a huge part of communion? Um, you know, first we have this responsibility to communicate God's word to one another. But that's so that we can hold it in communion and share that together. And that's really through the the giving of ourselves um, in and through all of our differences. So I would see that extending into then something, even into a scene like that. Um, That truth is still there. Um, Mm. And that's why a mother, mothers really get (laughs) self-sacrifice, like you said. So it isn't that all the, and it's hard, it's horrifying to think that both, uh, men and women in our culture today, the first thing we think of is, is kind of a voyeuristic thing right. um, it, to video. It's horrifying. It. Yeah. It's, it, uh, I saw yeah. a scene like that um, at senior week at the beach and it was going all over the internet and I couldn't watch it, but I saw the first, like there was a, a fight breaking out on the uh, boardwalk at the beach and it's drunk boys and girls, or I guess young men and women, you can say. And this poor guy just was getting, teamed on by several guys and here was a a girl a teenage girl with a cell phone camera right in his face videotaping this Mm. poor young man just getting beat up and and i should point out too that uh you know i I spent uh, my teen years mostly on the streets so i'm not horribly afraid of a fight but um my first thought when I have to step into those situations is like, ah, oh, I don't want to get my butt kicked either. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> because, because I know enough to know that you can't always tell by the outside, you know, um, how, how good of a, a fight it's going to be. So, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I think this is something that we all, that we all fear and it, it okay. It's, it's a good distinction. I, I like how well, you and it's also in there. to get people to safety doesn't necessarily yeah. mean you get into a full out yes. fight with somebody. Exactly. Yeah. You're not trying to uh, create a movie scene. Exactly. You're, you're trying, <laughs> trying to resolve it as peaceably as you can. Um, so I wonder um, in your thinking, um, well, as the famous orator, Michael Scott once said, uh, <laughs> Webster's defines wedding as the fusing of two metals with a hot torch. I wonder um, why marriage place uh, a central role in your thinking about uh, gender and the way that you've been using the term here and yes. w- uh, how you see weddings used strategically and metaphorically throughout scripture uh, to build theology. Uh, see, and I think work. that's it right there is that um, I believe that our bodies tell the story of Christ's love for his bride, the church. So um, for me, it's all about the spousal love of Christ and 
uh, you've got the, the Bible opening with a wedding. You've got the Bible closing with a wedding. Um, when you behold the bride in Revolution, Revelation 21, 2, um, to behold her is to behold the holy city of Jerusalem adorned for mm. her husband. It's, it's so glorious. And then you've got uh, Hosea, Jeremiah, um, you know, so some of these major prophets, Isaiah, talking about the uh, God's people as his bride and even, you know, comparing her idolatry to adultery. And then you've got the, in the right smack in the middle of our Bibles, we have the Song of Songs, which is this beautiful love story slash wedding, I believe, truly telling us the spousal love of Christ for his bride, which is interesting because we have the Mm -hmm. woman's voice dominant in that song and she opens it and she closes it and it's, it's immodest, but you really do see this reciprocity there. Mm. Um, and then in Ephesians, you've got Paul saying, don't you get it, married people? <laughs> mm. I'm speaking about a great mystery here of Christ's love for his church. And so he's kind of interpreting creation for us. Um, and in the song, I think, because I see a scriptural allusion there when he's talking about being spotless, the bride being spotless. Um, you see that in Song of Songs 4. So I just think this is this is the meta narrative of scripture. In the song, we see it enfleshed, uh, the whole meta narrative of Christ's love for his people, for his bride. And so I believe that is the story our bodies tell in our ma- marriages, but also in uh, singleness and virginity, and mm-hmm. also in uh, our brother sister relationships, because we're also showing this. Um, this collectiveness of the bride of Christ as brothers and sisters. And you see that too. And at the end of revelation, um, the woman is adding her voice to the spirits at the very end saying, come, she's calling her brothers to perseverance, to come to this water of life that her own body represents in its homology. It's, it's quite fascinating. You have that story in the, with the woman of the well and John four, which is, so fascinating because right before that we have uh, John the Baptist identifying himself as the bridegroom, uh, as the best man of the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. And then what do you have next? You have him coming up to this woman at the well, which that's where people went to find their brides <laughs> back in the day. You know, you, the well narrative is, is a wedding narrative. Yeah. Um, and, and here's genesis. this water of life that he's talking about there. And, and, and what does it do? It sends her out on a mission. She goes and she calls the whole town to come and see. So I do think that it's a much bigger theological picture going on. Yeah. Well, Amy Bird, thank you for all your biblical theological insights. I love how you um, don't come at an angle into the text, but you seem to be down on the ground with the text working through it. And uh, it's very instructive for me. And it has really helped me think through uh, lots of things reading your work. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. You've been listening to the Biblical Mind podcast, exploring the deep structures of Christian scripture. For more, visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find good podcast content.